This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back as we should be. We should be back. We're here. It's Wednesday, and I can set your clock, 4 o'clock on a Wednesday. Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Um, Maria Tomei, you're the co-host. What do you think about that? I think the whole state of clean energy is pretty good, as we'll <laughs> find out here. It could be better, of course, because we're working towards 100% renewable energy. Yeah, that's yeah. our job. Yep. Okay, and a fellow to Maria's right, stage right, mm -hmm. Rocky Mould. He's with the city and county. Hi, Rocky. Hello, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Great to see you on, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Okay. <laughs> Peter Rosseg from Hawaiian Electric, thank you for coming down. Always a pleasure, Jay. Always Great to pleasure. have you guys here. So we begin with a snippet, may I say? <laughs> <laughs> and this snippet is about community solar. Press release article in PBN this morning. Uh, hot stuff about community solar. Tell us about it, Peter. Well, this morning, Wednesday, July 11th at 8 o'clock, we opened the proverbial floodgates uh, and began accepting applications for what we call subscriber organizations that want to create a, a community solar project. We had at least two uh, come in today and maybe more before uh, I left the office. It might and be more right now as we speak. Yeah. As we speak. And uh, this is the first step in opening up community solar. And as you know, community solar is an opportunity for people who don't own a roof or can't put solar on their roof or live in high rises or renters or businesses that are in that kind of a situation to participate in this solar transformation we have going on here in Hawaii. We have the greatest number of, uh, greatest percentage of solar uh, anywhere in, in the United States, certainly, and probably the world. And But if you didn't own a roof, you were not in a situation where you could take advantage of it. And we've been trying to deal with this for some time, and now we're, we're underway. So the first step will be for uh, any kind of a company or organization that meets certain qualifications to apply to be one of these subscriber organizations. And once they have gone through the process of completing an application and proposing a project, they will be able to recruit subscribers, customers of the utility on each island, uh, uh, each company in Maui Electric, of course, for Maui, Molokai and Lanai, Hawaii Electric Light for the Big Island and, and Honolulu, Hawaii Electric for Oahu. And those people will be able to subscribe to this project and when the project is up and running, these subscribers will get a credit on their bill based on the output of the community solar project and the level of their participation, how much they've, uh, they've, they've gone in on it. So uh, it is very much like having solar on your roof, except you don't need a roof. That's why we call it solar without a roof. Uh, it's hassle-free. You don't have to worry about repairing or cleaning or dealing with a bunch of stuff on your roof or what it does to your roof. It can't, you know, it's not going to blow away because it's somewhere else in the, in the community. And if you decide to move, you can take it with you as long as you're on the same island with the same electric company. So it's hassle-free. It gives everybody, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot, a lot of people who couldn't participate before. So we're very excited about this. And, you know, we have to serve everyone. One. That's the obligation of the electric utility. And it has bothered us for a long time that, that there was an opportunity for people who owned the roof to put solar on the roof. Great for them. Uh, not so great for people that couldn't. And, but they're all our customers. We are the only you know, organization really that represents all these people. And so we're very optimistic that this is going to help to level, level things out. I have two questions. Speak. Then it's Maria's turn. <laughs> okay. First question. <clears throat> um, what's the money here? Who's going to pay for the development of the uh, community solar facility? And secondly, what's the money in terms of the of the bill? You mentioned that uh, there would be a better credit on the bill. Right. Whose bill is that? Is that your bill or is that the developer's bill? Well, let's assume I live in a high rise, so I could very well be a possible subscriber. 
the, the organization, whether it be a company or a club or a family or um, a church or any kind of an organization that can qualify, uh, can build the, build the facility. And uh, so the, you know, the initial money or the credit worthiness has got to be with that organization. Uh, and they're going, to, they're going to secure the land, build the, you know, hire, or if, if they're a developer of solar themselves, they'll build it themselves, but they will build the project. I will then uh, pay a money, pay a certain amount of money based on how much the, the share of that, the output of that facility like that I want to. a piece of a company. Like uh, it, it, it's not like that because it's not a strictly a, a stock or a, security it is owning a piece of the output okay and so um, based on that and the the public utilities commission has set the the credit rate so whatever my share of the output of that facility is that's sent into the grid and goes around to all our customers is all shared in that way whatever my part of that is uh, i will get a credit based on the kilowatt hours uh, 15 cents on Oahu, more on the neighbor islands where electricity is more expensive. So then when my bill comes, it'll it say... from Hawaiian Electric. From Hawaiian Electric, my electric, Hawaii Electric. When my electric bill comes, it'll say, you used X amount total from the utility, and here's what that would cost you. But you got a credit here for the money that, for the amount of energy that came into the system from your share of that thing, and that's going to be deducted up to a very close, but not entirely 100%. You can't, you can't, you know, you can't uh, use credit against certain uh, fixed charges and certain things that the Public Utilities Commission collects, like the money they use for Hawaii Energy. You can't get out of paying that. You've got to pay that and certain other standard fees. But potentially, you could offset 75, 80, 90 percent of your bill. Am I going to pay bill. less? Or are you going to pay less in this case? Well, uh, in, in long, the term of probably the 20-year term you're going to own that, you will definitely save money. When I say definitely, everybody's got to sit down and look at this for themselves. There may be cases where people don't use enough energy to make it worthwhile, just like there are situations where people who own a roof look at the cost of putting solar on their roof and say, you know, that really doesn't pencil out. Mm. You're going to have to, and, and the, the subscriber organizations that are building these will help people uh, show them how, you know, what their savings will be over the long term. But just like you put solar on a roof, you put a lot of money in right up front, and but over the course of your ownership of that, you're going to save money uh, on what you're on you your have to work that out. You have to figure that out for yourself. It, it, like any other, you know, we can't. We're not in the you know in the financial advice business, fortunately or unfortunately. But you are in the wiring business, and I assume yeah. the wires between the community solar facility and the homeowner, those are Hawaiian Electric wires. Well, the, there's no physical relationship between community solar and me, the the owner. Everything that that solar facility creates goes into the grid and is shared around by oh. everybody. Oh. That's the difference. It's it, we call it community solar, but think of it more as shared solar. Got it. Uh, there's a unit. There's a facility. It could be an Eva. I live in New Juana. It could be an Eva. It could be anywhere on the island, and that's pumping electricity into the grid. It doesn't. You know, those electrons may or may not ever reach my house, but I get the 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 credit for what that is putting into the system. So uh, that's one of the beauties of it. You know, it, it enables us to um, help, help the subscriber organizations put these things in places where they'll do the most good. You know, solar goes on the roof, wherever it is, whether it's Mililani or Kailua or whatever. It's on the guy's roof, on the owner's roof, and that's where it is. But in this case, there are better places and worse places to have a solar farm. So the, the, they, these, solar farms will or solar facilities will have to come in and you know be able to interconnect to the system but there's no physical relationship between me Got the it. owner and that facility Got even it. if i were living next door to it i would not be getting electricity directly from it it would be going into the grid going around with all the other generation that we pump into the grid and we i would be taking it's, out it sounds pressure. very enlightened actually especially when you think about the increase in renewable energy but uh, query, uh, why, why does utility like it? How is this going to change you know, the, the utility and the way the utility does business? Sure. As I said, the, these, uh, these solar facilities one will have to be, uh, have a, a meter, a monitor, 
And in a very extreme situation, we would be able to stop taking power from them. All of those hundreds of solar systems on the roof, we can't really see them. We know they're there. We know they're putting electricity into the system. And we can't control them. So even when there's too much power on the system, we can't deal with that. And it makes it much more difficult to, you know, to drive the car because it's as if somebody else in the back seat is stepping on the gas or stepping on the, and we can't see it. We don't know when it, we can't stop them from doing it. And we have to accommodate that, that flow of electricity from uh, many thousands of different units. This will be a fairly substantial, maybe a small one, maybe a big one, but we will be able to see exactly what's coming into the so system. So this helps you in building out the grid in a way that you can control things right. and you can get more data. Your turn, Maria. Okay. Well, there's not much I can say except I look forward to seeing how it goes and I hope it goes well. Um, I did want to ask, you know, you were talking about specific locations being yeah. better. Is there a map? Have you made that information available it to developers? It is absolutely available. As a matter of fact, one of the things we are asking potential subscriber organizations to do is to go to the website for each electric company and there's what's called a uh, locational value map. Don't ask me why it's called that, but it will show you where it'll, it will be easy to hook up and where it will be much more difficult to hook up. And that's, of course, the same situation that a lot of homeowners have been in over a period of time. Uh, in, in places where there's an awful lot of rooftop solar, uh, the circuits are, are tapped out or essentially full and can't take more without uh, an extensive study and perhaps without additional construction that can be very expensive. So one of the things the subscriber organization or their, their agent, you know, if they're working with a solar company needs to do is go and say, here's a piece of land. Is it in a place where it can be hooked up to the grid without too much of this interconnection issue that we have if you know if you're trying to do it in the middle of Kailua or in the middle of Mililani or in the middle of Eva Beach don't because those areas are fairly heavily subscribed already so in that respect it will but there are certainly big stretches of the island that get plenty of sunshine that and certainly also on the neighbor islands that get plenty of sunshine that are not in that congested situation uh, especially on Hawaii Island, which has got, you know, percentage-wise, the least solar of any of the islands, as you know. So the idea is to get these located in places that will make it the easiest to hook them up and give us the most efficiency for the construction. And, and go fast. Uh, well, we want them to be, you know, as quickly as they can, for sure. And yeah. part of that fast, you know, the actual construction of a solar facility does, is not terribly time consuming. It's getting to the point where you can begin construction, very frankly, getting through the permitting, getting through the, the technical issues, and the fewer technical issues we face. So there would be fewer when you have community solar. We believe there will be fewer uh, in the overwhelming number of cases. Rocky, you look like you're bursting with intellectual <laughs> curiosity. Why, 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 why don't we let you ask a question or two yourself? So if, a, if an aggregator or a company wants to is in a high uh, penetrated circuit, a highly penetrated yeah. circuit, would they be able to add maybe energy storage or grid services to it to be able to interconnect? Great question. You bring along these technical guys, they know so. <laughs> Not in the first phase. In the first phase, uh, to keep things relatively simple, the, uh, we're not, you know, the Public Utilities Commission has said uh, no storage. You know, these are straightforward facilities. But, uh, and there's eight megawatts uh, across the five islands that we serve. Uh, and, and in the second phase, which could come within about a year and a half or two years, I think we will expand to uh, allow energy storage because that would be the natural thing to do. We have to work out the financial situation a little differently because if you can store the energy and send it to us at a different time of day, it has a different value than if you're sending it to us in the middle of the day. So it, it will not be a, a, you know, a slam dunk. We're going to have to put our, our brainy engineers and accountants to work on it. But going forward, ancillary services, as you say, you know, helping to support the grid, batteries, energy storage in, the ter in uh, terms of batteries, I think those will be coming in the second phase. And uh, it, at the moment, it's just solar. And it's usually community solar is kind of how everybody knows it. But technically, in the second phase, I think, or, or there's shortly thereafter, it could be a wind farm. Mm -hmm. could be wind turbines. It could be uh, running water. If, you're, if you've got a 
place where you can do hydro on a piece of property and, and uh, you know, can get a bunch of people to come in with you, you could have community hydro. Uh, and so the opportunities will expand as, you know, this is the first time we've done this here. It's been done other places on the mainland and they have a lot of experience, but as we all know, Hawaii's grids are very unique and very, you know, freestanding, very small, um, and, and we don't have the, the ability to put a lot of extra things on it without endangering the, the, the stability of the grid. But as we move forward, we're going to see this expand more and more, and that, that's the idea. Peter, where can we read about this? Is, you have it on your website? Absolutely. All the, each of the three companies, hawaiianelectric.com uh, slash community solar, one word, Maui Electric slash community solar, Hawaii Electric Light dash community solar. It, we've got all the documents and all the information that's needed for a subscriber organization. And we have a little bit of information for subscribers because until we have some of these projects approved, uh, there's nothing a subscriber can do okay, except they wait. can read up and get they a can re on. read up, understand how it works, start thinking about you know figuring out what they need to think about to know if it's for them. Peter Rosse, Hawaiian Electric, thank you so much for coming down. Always a pleasure. We take a short break, then we're going to talk to Rocky in some detail. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. The, the lady at the far end is Maria Tomei, and she is now going to, to, take, to take the time to make a nice introduction of Rocky Mould with the city and county. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jay. Hey, Rocky, thanks for being here. Yeah, um, congratulations on having such a wonderful job title that we couldn't really fit it on, on your, <laughs> your title, but... Um, so the Office of Sustainability, uh, wait. The Office of Climate Change, Climate Change. Sustainability, Sustainability, and Resiliency. And Resiliency, there you go, with the City and County of Honolulu. And Rocky's got the best part of that because he's on the energy program. So, um, and before that, he has had experience in a variety of other um, endeavors which somehow do tend to relate to energy yeah, so yeah. yeah so um tell us what you're up to now or what your office is up to and then we'll get into so um questions. so yeah thanks for having me on the show um so the office uh, office of climate change sustainability and resiliency uh we've been uh going strong for about a year now um i'm the energy program manager and i've been i've been uh, in that position for about seven months um we have a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. We're part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network. And what we've been doing is putting a resilience strategy together to build resilience for the city and county of Honolulu um, so, that, so that when we get hit by shocks and stresses, we're able to adapt to those and actually thrive going forward. These are things like hurricanes, um, tsunamis, financial crises, income inequality, things like this. And um, so we're developing a strategy to address those. And we've now just finished uh, phase one of that strategy where we've identified through a pretty intensive um, community outreach program uh, four discovery areas that we're going to look at to go on a deeper dive uh, for our strategy. Yes, four. Yeah. What four? Um, so the four are um, disaster preparedness. Uh, you know what we've seen in, in with Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, as well as you know Her Superstorm Sandy, 
uh, the mudslides that we had recently uh, on Kauai and, and even here in East Oahu, um, we really need to be to prepare ourselves for disasters. Uh, also, uh, affordability is an issue that's sort of tearing at the seams of of of, of you know folks here in in, in our society here. Uh, also. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, community engagement. How can we harness the community uh, to really work towards uh, the goals that we have and really build on our strengths to, 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 to strengthen our resilience? And then finally, and this is where I really come in, uh, climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, because simultaneously, uh, we're putting together a climate action and adaptation plan, and so, that, that planning process is going to dovetail with our resilience strategy process. Wow, a million questions flow into yeah. mind. But first, Maria, I know for your show, I know you're always saying the news first, right at the top, the news. And so, you know, we had a brief um, presentation from Peter about the news because they just opened the CBRE program to subscriber organizations this morning. So that's today, you know, news from today. But you've got something coming up. Um, well, we, we, have, um, we have a community, uh, we have a stakeholder meeting that's coming up uh, uh, on July 27th. Um, it's actually to folks that are sort of part of our working group, but this is really to launch our climate action and resilience strategy process into phase two. And starting in August, we are going to be taking, taking this, this meeting on the road, and we're going to be engaging communities uh, in, in all nine of our districts here uh, on Oahu uh, to discuss these four discovery areas uh, and get their feedback in Mana'o. Okay. Mm. So yeah. are those during the day or in the evening, weekends? How, wh we have not kind of scheduled okay. them yet, but they're, okay. but they're, they're going to start in August. Okay, but, so you know, but, but news will be coming up. Yeah. Announced. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, sorry. it's exciting. Yeah, so I know, Jay, you said you had a bunch of questions about them. Yeah, those four I mean, it's, it's really a, a potpourri, those four things. Um, and they include, and, and this is, uh, I'd like you to help me understand it, they include extreme things, like disasters, like, yeah. like extreme weather, which, you know, coming soon, um, like, well, I don't know, earthquakes, no, uh, mm -hmm. tsunamis, uh, mm -hmm. hurricanes for sure, um, on the one hand. And then you have, what, affordability of, of land, I guess, of occupancy occupancy and income disparity, that comes a lot slower. Right. Uh, sometimes it's harder to see yep. it, yep. and you, it's only on a chart rather than, yep. you know, hits you in the face. Um, those are really different kinds of things. Yep. Um, and, and, and I'd like to confirm one point, too, that when you're talking about these things, you're not, I, I think, you can rec correct me, you're not talking about preventing them. You're talking about being resilient to them which means when they arrive and knock at your door, yeah. then you have, to be, you have to adapt to them. So right. resiliency in the context I thought you described, resiliency is adaptation. Resilience is dealing with the new reality, the new normal created by these four, these four, yeah. these four bad things. Um, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but you're not gonna be out there uh, saving me when the storm comes. You're going to be trying to build a community now around me so that when it comes and when we have the worst of it, um, we can get back on track. Am I right about that? that that's, that's about right, yeah. You, you sum that up pretty well. Uh, we look at you know, you know, short-term sort of shocks to the system, like storms that, that hit. And being, being resilient to those is super important. The, you know, the, the grid staying up and getting up and running quickly is, is a concern. But there are also these longer-term stressors. And, the ability to, to take that hit, to take that initial shock, and then come back is strengthened by, you know, building up, you know, addressing some of these longer-term things that 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 sap the vitality uh, of of our response. And if you look at Puerto Rico, what went on there? I mean, a lot of the the problems in the reason they weren't as prepared for Hurricane Maria were were, were economic problems, um, you know, not underinvestment in their grid, things like these. That, that, that left them vulnerable when, when the time did it. So that's why we look at both these longer term stressors and these shocks that hit the system. And by the way, we, we identified these four areas through a pretty intensive stakeholder engagement process where we went out, to, but as of tomorrow, we will have gone to all 33 neighborhood boards 
um, where we polled the neighborhood boards um, and we also went to you know civil society groups and chambers of commerce and and other other uh, civil society members and and polled them and 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 asked for their feedback on what they thought were these stresses. Uh, and, and so we were, our, our selection of these was really informed by this stakeholder engagement I process. wanted to ask you about yeah. that, yeah. Though. you know. So if, if, you, if you ask me cold, how do I figure out how to be more resilient? I would say, well, you, you get a dozen guys, really smart guys, including Maria, mm -hmm. in the room, okay? And you close the doors and you bring in pizza and you figure it out. <laughs> if it takes you a weekend or, or a week, you figure it out. And at the end of the day, the smart guys can figure out those four stress areas because they live here, because they read, they see the newspapers, they're familiar mm -hmm. with our society. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but you're not talking about that. You're talking about stakeholder meetings. You're talking about, oh, lots and lots and lots of mm -hmm. stakeholder meetings. Mm -hmm. now, so if I go out to a stakeholder meeting, wherever it is, um, out of a group of 100 people that shows up, I'm not going to get 100 smart guys. Sorry, that's the reality mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get one or two smart guys, and the rest, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't follow this. They don't read the newspaper. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they haven't studied it. They don't have advanced degrees in it. What's the point of having... Why don't you just make the plan? Yeah. Why don't you just make the plan? Forget the stakeholder meetings. Yeah. Tell me why. Well, I think there's been a lot of you know, anecdotal and, and research out there about uh, the need for broad-based community support for initiatives. I mean, if you don't have support from the no, community. You're not talking about for the initiative. Yeah. You're talking about helping you make the initiative. Right. You're talking right. about helping you run on through the planning right. process. You really need them for that. It's, Why don't you just make the plan okay. and then yeah. get their support? So I got a question we, for is, you. Yeah. Well, if you have those 12 smart people in a room coming up with the, the plan, how different do you think that would be from what you get if you have a robust stakeholder process with all those different viewpoints also coming up with a plan? Very different. I, you, I think you want me to say very, that, and I'm going to say it. It's very no, different. I'm also going to say this, very Maria. Similar. I'm also going to say this. But carry this on. Is, this goes to the energy and the stakeholders and, and the, uh, all, all those meetings that went on for years and years without a result, if you remember. That's where, that's where I come yeah. from. Meetings that go on for years yeah. and years without a result. Okay, so the, the difference is the plan will be different, but the time frame will also be different. And the, and the question I put to you, you know, rapper, the rapper question uh -huh. to both of you is, do we have the time? In terms of climate change and sea level rise and some of these things that we're seeing? Well, yeah, that's, that's the name of your well, commission now. Right. Well, you know, our schedule, we're scheduled to release our strategy. Our strategy will be released in, sometime in the first quarter, first half of 2019. So within, within a year and a half of our founding and, and getting the... That's pretty good. Yeah. So, um, and you know, and once, once we've identified these areas, it's really we are built, going into a deep dive with experts. We're forming working groups of, of subject matter experts in those areas you know, locally to, to really dive into those questions, facilitated by members of, of, of CCSR, our office's staff. Um, so we are doing that. We are going in with experts. And actually, we also have a, we have a steering committee uh, made up of leaders uh, from our community. And we have an internal city resilience team uh, made up of department heads and subject matter experts across the city. And then we also have um, formed uh, concurrently with our office, there is a city climate change commission, and it's made up of five uh, academics and scientists that are in, are charged with informing decision uh, city decision making uh, on science based um, uh, policies and projects to address climate change uh, and um, and you know resiliency. Maria, I got to ask one more question. I'm going to yeah. turn this whole thing over to you. No, okay? no, no. Yeah. Carry on. <clears throat> so. Um, you come up with this, and yeah. somewhere along the line, it's going to be written down. There's going to be a report. Um, I mean, and it'll be a big report because you have a lot of stakeholders and people who attended the meetings. You have to, you have to include them all, their thought process, the A or nay. Mm -hmm. And so we have a report. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this report now is going to make us more resilient. Mm -hmm. But who does it? The yeah. Rockefeller Foundation gave you money. I forget what it is. Is it a hundred million dollars? How much? No, oh, we 100, wish. Twenty uh, million. Yeah. 
not even, not even close. Ten million. Okay. A couple million dollars. Couple, I don't know the exact million. figures. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Gave you money. That frankly has been really helpful to getting us up to capacity. Um, and we, you know, that, that's, that's, that's to make a report. Yeah, it's actually, you know, yeah. Okay, so now you have to report. Money. And of course, the risk we all know is is the yeah. the shelf problem. Yes. The the, the report goes neatly no. on shelf no. SJ67 there, and the dust falls on yeah. it. Yeah. So we have to make this report into a reality. Yeah. We have to make this report actually work yeah. and create real live. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. the word? Uh, uh, Actions, progress. Action, yeah. yeah. Success. And, okay, yeah. and so <laughs> when you're done with the money from the Rockefeller Foundation, you have all, you know, all these things yeah. worked out, I mean, or suggestions, or even a really ton concrete kind of plan, hopefully, mm -hmm. come out of it. Um, how, how are you going to implement that? How are you so, going to make it happen? So, how are you going to make me more, not sustainable, but, uh, uh, not sustainable, but... Resilient? Resilient. Yeah, yeah. How are you going to make my community more resilient? Yeah. When I walk down the street, yeah. and I do every day, and I look around, how am I going to know that I'm more resilient against the, the, four, the four horsemen of the apocalypse? You know, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think that that is where, you know, our office comes in. You know, our, our office is, is institutional capacity that's going to live past the creation of this plan. Uh, we're we're going to be charged with, you know, making sure that that plan is implemented, and we're going to be accountable for implementing that plan. Uh, we make ourselves accountable to that. The the budgets and the projects themselves take place within the departments of the city, and so. But our job is really to infuse these ideas of sustainability and resiliency throughout all those all those departments. Once we've sort of created this policy framework and plan going forward. This is Chip Fletcher on this commission? Chip Fletcher is on the commission. He's a great yeah. guy. Yeah. It's important and what yeah. he's done. And every now and then yeah. you see those coastal yeah. coastal um, yeah. charts and graphs showing inundation. And, and the way that you deal with this, as they do in lower Manhattan, actually, um, is you build infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. so, so you prevent uh, erosion and, and the, the effects of you know, inundation. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's concrete. It's infrastructure. It's expensive, mm -hmm. okay. So, um, th does your commission have a, uh, a building division? Uh, I mean, how, how do we? How do you build that infrastructure, Rocky? Well, um, you know, funding of infrastructures is one of the chief, you know, challenges we have going forward. Um, the one thing I do know is, is in in your plans for how you build them, you better address sea level rise and climate change and these kinds and of funding. things going and forward, funding. right? And yeah, absolutely. You know, an undercurrent cutting through all of these themes is how do you align the budget processes and budget making on these really big, important, you know, these strategic huge goals? Huge questions. Yeah, these are huge this questions. Is transformation yeah. of the city government the, you're talking about, Maria. And if we go back to the original debate over the twelve people and you know who come up with a plan without you know input or socializing it versus the law the longer and messier and noisier process that involves a lot more people you mentioned sitting on a shelf you know the report gets done sits on a shelf so your 12 guys in a room would read that report they'd feel some ownership they'd care nobody else would care. <laughs> seriously whereas if you get everybody involved including the folks that you didn't think mm -hmm. were experts but are affected by the affordability and mm -hmm. they vote mm -hmm. and they speak and they care mm -hmm. and they're they're care mm -hmm. enough to yeah. show up at the community meetings Okay. You would be surprised how much, you're exactly right. When it how, comes to yeah. implement, yeah. not only yeah. have they maybe looked at the report, okay, so yeah. everybody's going to read these reports, but yeah. they've looked at it, they care, they had input, they had a reaction, their input was acknowledged, they can under, and they heard the input does, of the other folks. Does this mean they will tolerate a huge increase in taxes? You know, if you're going to be building stuff anyway, and you are, We've got to, cities need to be built. You're talking about the cost of infrastructure. You're building it anyway. If you build it better because you're more informed and you're looking forward to those challenges, you know, you're not talking about building stuff necessarily that wouldn't have existed at all. You may be building it a little more durable. You may be building it in a different spot, but you're building it better and you wind up saving money instead of mm -hmm. having to rebuild stuff that ignored the realities that we're facing. Okay, my so, takeaway, so, okay, you can think of yours because you're going to have your chance in a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> my takeaway on this, as I alluded to it a minute ago, is that this, this commission is really, really important 
because the four horsemen of the apocalypse can bring us down. And if we do nothing, they will bring us down. But by virtue of the, uh, the weather or by virtue of uh, inappropriate uh, values on land, which will create the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the polarity, diversity, yeah. uh, polarization that we, we really yeah. can't afford to have in an island community. Um, so your commission can save us, okay? And so it may not be $100 million. It may be just enough of seed money to get the thing started. But you know, Rocky, this is a really important deal you're on. And I hope we hear lots from you about it. And I hope that it is socialized. And I hope the people understand mm -hmm. they have to participate because we're involved. And I mean, it's so clear to me, this is a transformation of our society. If we don't transform, we're going to be in deep kimchi. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the inundation of the kimchi monster. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm you know, the four horse. I really got to really give credit to the administration and, and Mayor Caldwell for really taking leadership and creating this office. And really, this office is is kind of the vehicle to address these really you know difficult, challenging issues, you know existential issues probably in the long run that we're that we're facing right now. So. Um, we feel it, and we, we are uh, motivated uh, to, to, to take on these issues head on. Yeah, then yeah. you have to come back and give us yeah. blow by blow. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Maria, what's your takeaway? What, what, how does this change your way of thinking this afternoon? Well, I was, you know, very interested to hear, you know, all the stuff that you're, you're working on. And, you know, first quarter, early 2019 is not that far away. Right. So um, I wish you, wish you luck. Thank we'll you. keep an eye open for the report. I'm just waiting for Jay to come up with names for those poor horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> you know, or something. You have very uh, vivid imagery there, you know, so kind of like putting the humor in. in they're the, they're uh, coming the, for us, yeah, Maria. Yeah, they're humor coming. Here, but, we have to be yeah. ready for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you're going to read that, right? Yeah. You're going you're gonna to read the report. <laughs> You got. You got to well, get a quote we, from him. We're going to all read it yeah. together, Put right it here in at there this table. Somewhere, yeah. oh, you got to we'll, get we'll, a quote from him in there somewhere, definitely. so yeah. that he's got to go find his name. You okay. know, in the old yeah. days, we had phone books, and it got delivered to your. Oh, I guess we still have phone books, yeah. but you know, when you actually looked yeah. to, to see if they got you in the phone book, it's the same thing. You get the report. Yeah. Hey, do they have my favorite? And I, and I will say, we book. are we are actually doing stuff. We we are actually acting on. Some of these, some you know, these issues right away. I mean, we have a 100% renewable transportation goal that the mayor is committed to, and you know, we have in our budget, you know, you know, somewhere between 10 to 25 million, to actually to 35 million dollars that could be used, and, and I know a, a portion of it's going to be used on implementing electric buses. We've been testing electric buses and route structures and rate structures and how they, how we can transform our entire transfer, uh, transportation system to make it clean uh, and renewable to you know address you know what is essentially you know, ground transportation is what it's like 25 to 30 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions that we have so we are addressing these things head huge, on huge yeah. responsibility yeah. No. and before i offer you the opportunity to give your last words that doesn't sound right give give some final words um to our to our mm -hmm. listeners i just want to say that if you go to melbourne uh, in australia they have free trams all over and the economy has blossomed as a result mm -hmm. so when you say rate structure consider free free mm -hmm. is a really good rate for mm -hmm. buses whatever the technology okay so rocky take a minute see the red light the red light is pointing at you i don't see I it don't yet, see the it's red there somewhere the red light. Yeah. okay uh, see the red light you're you're on uh, tell them what you want to leave with them today um, I want you all to know that we at the city and county of Honolulu, we are, you know, um, moving ahead um, to address these issues uh, through our new Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency, uh, or CCSR, and, you know, um, look out for some of the things that we have, some of the announcements that we will have coming up. Uh, if you want to take a look at our, our website to learn about more about what we're doing, you can go to www.resilientoahu.org. Um, uh, and uh, we look forward to engaging you in the future. Thank you so much for having me on and, and the time. Maria, Thank you. Can, you, can you give Rocky a big thanks? And can you say a nice farewell to our viewers? Thank you very much, Rocky. And as soon as uh, we have a chance to get you back on here to talk about how you've finished the plan and show Jay where his uh, name is in there, or at least a quote from him, <laughs> I really look forward to having that discussion. And thank you all for watching. It's a state of clean energy. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Rocky. Thank you. Aloha.